You ever heard of the word genogram? Well, if you're anything involved, anything at all in counseling or uh, marriage and family therapy or in psychology, you might have come across it here and there. Well, here's one of the legendary authors in the book of genograms. She also is the author of the current book called Family Life Cycle. It's a fabulous book that I recommend. She's the author of a host of other books. We're going to get to those in a minute. She is the director, Dr. Monica McGoldrick, the director of the Multicultural Family Institute and on the clinical factory faculty of the psychiatry of psychiatry at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Just reading an article about factories, so that didn't help me. She has an international reputation as a trainer and author. Her other books include Ethnicity and Family Therapy, as well as Genograms, the third edition, Living Beyond Loss, and a host of other so let's further ado let's welcome dr mcgoldrick welcome doctor happy to be here so this is really fascinating as i mentioned earlier before we got on to the show i'm actually using your textbook in the class fabulous textbook um the family life cycle it really covers all the different things that happen to us as human beings mm -hmm. but what i wanted to talk about first is genograms what are they well, they're basically maps of who we belong to, is the simple way to put it. It's like a, a fancy word for a family tree, but it includes more of the uh, emotional process and also the informal connections than a family tree does. Interesting. And it really does help a therapist, if I'm correct, and a psychologist to really get a better understanding of the client? Absolutely. I, I consider it totally essential. I don't know how you can help a person if you do not pay attention to who they belong to and try to think of helping them solve their problems in the context of who, who they belong to, where they're coming from, you know, who they're related to. So how uh, does one... What are you looking for, better said? We'll start there. What are you looking for in the genogram? And I want to send a picture over to our producer, or maybe he can look one up and post it up so that people can see what a genogram looks like. Okay. Um, so what are you looking for necessarily in a genogram? Looking for, uh, well, in terms of the problematic relationships, um, well, especially cutoffs, anybody who is not on speaking terms with members of their immediate family or where they have continual conflict or, uh, and it often goes along the same lines, somebody who is, you know, can't make a decision without that, uh, without another person's uh, input. So they're what we would think of as fused together. Ah, gotcha. So the, you're looking at the relationships and how they're interacting within the family itself. Exactly. And, uh, and how far back do you and, like? Go ahead. And I just want to want to sure uh, add a, a thought there. Um, as we look at patterns of of cutoff and fusion, what we're really looking for uh, is what we think of as triangles, where two people's relationship has become organized around their relationship with a third. So understanding how triangles operate, which is a dysfunction, very, very common. We all do it, but it's a dysfunctional pattern. So this is starting to sound a little bit uh, familiar to me. Are you you're dabbling a little bit here in Bowen theory? Or are you, are you in Bowen theory? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay. Very, I'm very much steeped in Bowen theory. It's <laughs> very, very fundamental to how I, how I have always thought. Not how I always thought, but you know, from so, the point I heard it. Yeah. And in regards to the fusion, and how far back do you go? I mean, do do you go to the grandparents? Do you go as far back as they can? Okay. So initially, let's say in a first interview. Um, I would want to go back and find out about people's grandparents and go down as far as, you know, if they have grandchildren, I'd go five generations, two up and two down. Okay. Uh, over time, when I get to know them better and depending what the patterns are, I, I might suggest that we look beyond that if they know anything. 
you know, often people don't know much past their grandparents. They might not even know much about their grandparents. Oh, but I consider it very important because if you think about it, in, in your immediate family, which is constructed by your parents, who they are is so determined by the families that they came from that is, in my view, impossible to understand them without that, you know, at the very least. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now that well, I'm looking at it vertically, so we're going to grandparents and grandchildren up or down either way. Do you also go horizontally towards aunts and uncles and siblings? Absolutely. Absolutely. So... If, let's say I'm seeing somebody who's at the phase of launching. Okay, that's Dan Morin's genogram, is it? I think so. Yeah, that's a little bit of a different schema, but yeah. I can't see it too, too well. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Hopefully the audience can. <laughs> I'm just trying to give them a basic idea of what it looks like there. They got the boxes going from side to side. You know what? I could show you. Hold on a minute. Let me. Can you see if I do a screen share, perhaps? I, I'll just show you a couple of. Hold on a minute. Just very simple genograms. Sure. Sure. I've just been starting to play around with just to give uh, an idea of some of the basic, basic uh, structure of what a genogram is. And I'll, I'll make sure to tell the audience I actually use them as well. I think they work wonderfully. And we'll, hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about the different ways you can use genograms. You can look at the spiritual genogram. Okay, hold on a minute. Okay. I'm just starting to work on Donald Trump's genogram. Oh, no way. <laughs> can you see that? No, you can't see it. Can't You can't see that. Hold on. No, not yet. You can always okay. email us too, I think. I could email it to you, but I, you know what I can also do? I'll just share the screen. Okay. Uh, that way you can see it. Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, oh, there it is. There here's, it is. Um, here's his brother, Fred. This is actually Trumps. Yes. Well, wow. they're actually Trumps, if you... <laughs> actually, that's really true, actually. That, you know, the joke that their name is really Trump. Oh, is it people, really? It was really. Interesting. Um, that's his older brother who, who died of alcoholism. Oh, that's right. Now, you have a different shaded box, and that's usually reflecting that, correct? Yes, so these these symbols on the side reflect uh, possibilities where you can show a person's relationship. So, Is Donald, there two alcoholics there? Uh, this one says his other brother. Now, I'm not, really not sure. I just started on this, so I'm not okay. 100% sure. Uh, and I was just actually correcting the, uh, the information I had. So I don't want to actually use this much let me see if i've got uh something better here hold on let me it's fascinating work in her. progress here with dr donald i mean uh, dr mcgoldrick and donald trump here <laughs> it's hillary i got hers from a while back who that hillary clinton oh that'll be a fascinating one. Oh my gosh look at that <laughs> well that one showed uh and i spent a lot of time on obama so I've got a lot of them. I did also uh, Mitt Romney. So Hillary, here, Hillary and Bill and Chelsea. This was from way before. Bill, the reason why that's yellow, it shows that he was basically raised by his grandparents, not his mother. Oh, interesting. And her mother was raised by her grandparents. Her mother was? Yes. Her mother, Dorothy, was raised by her grandparents. Her parents divorced when she was young, and she and her sister were raised by their grandparents. Do you think that has some kind of unconscious connection there, or is that just a coincidence? Well, that's the very question that you have to uh, ask yourself. <laughs> uh, so let me switch back here from 
Yeah, we're shrinking. Yeah. Okay, there we are. <laughs> there we are. Fascinating stuff. That is really neat. And we can get these as well on your Multicultural Family Institute uh, org site. Well, I put together a, a story of Obama so that I've got quite, I've got actually several genograms and quite a few pictures. That's a fascinating one. I've never put up Hillary's, but I, I mean to get to it. Uh, be pretty big right now. Yeah. yeah Donald Trump, yeah. you could probably sell for about $100 a pop. <laughs> <laughs> I get the funny feeling. Um, and, go ahead. Yep. No, I was just going to say, uh, you can go on to Ancestry.com and get inform all kinds of information on people. So that's a great source for making a genogram. How oh, interesting. Is, yeah. Now, what do you think about these other more specific genograms, like spiritual genograms where you cover the re religious past, uh, the ones on addiction only? Are those effective as well? Well, the way I think about it is all genograms should include uh, information about addictions and all mm -hmm. kinds of health issues, all kinds of achievement issues and functioning problems, and all kinds of um, issues about relationships. So there might be a time where, let's say, somebody just has been... Um, diagnosed with an addiction or just realize, you know, is finally admitting that they have one, you certainly would want to do or, or make a, a, a genogram that, that focuses on the other addiction patterns in the family. Because one of the things I wanted to say, I didn't, we didn't quite finish the topic on what do you look for. Of course, you look for the dysfunctional patterns, but you also look for the resilience patterns. Oh, interesting. And it's really important, let's take addiction, that you track who in the family resolved those addiction issues and how did they do it. Because that's just as important as that your father had an alcohol problem and, you know, when you grow up he was not in a good place and so forth and so on. But if he then got sober, that would be a really important point. That's, that's a great point. Actually, it segues right into my next question, which is how would you use effectively a genogram with your client? So you're going to show them resilience. Uh, what other things would you show them on a genogram, such as Hillary Clinton, let's say if she was your client or somebody else that you can think of? Um, well, let's take Steve Jobs. There's another genogram I've yeah. done a lot of work on, and I would have some advice for Steve Jobs. Is that, I mean, since you're asking, you know, sure. what would I think of Hillary? I, know, I haven't thought about her for a while, but uh, <laughs> on Steve, jo Steve Jobs was adopted. Uh, and it was only as an adult that he even found out about his family, although he was always troubled by it. And his parents, we, you want to, we could look at that genogram for a minute, I, if I could pull it up. But anyway, let me just make the point. So he was very troubled by his parents having given him up. He, he would always be um, bothered that, you know, what, what was it? Why didn't they keep me? And in fact, the parents who were not married at the time he was born uh, because the mother's father disapproved and would not let them marry. Oh. Uh, the father was Syrian and he was a teacher. The mother was a student. And whether it was because he was Syrian, they were Wisconsin farmers. Anyway, so he was adopted in California by a family, interestingly enough, where the father was from a Wisconsin German farm family, exactly the same. As, as his real mother, oh, wow. and the mother was Armenian, which is very close to Syrian. So, in fact, he was raised culturally in a very similar family. Interesting. Here's, here's the point. When uh, he was an adult, he had a child with his 
with a girlfriend. He, he didn't marry her and he didn't accept for a long time. He didn't accept paternity for a long time until it was proven that he was the father. And even then, he did not engage his daughter for a very long time. Wow, it's almost similar to what happened to him. Exactly. Wow. And then it so happened that his sister, who's, who's actually a famous novelist named Mona Simpson, uh, asked him if he wanted to meet his father. And he said, no, he thought not. And then uh, it turned out that he had actually already met the father. In a rest, the father had a restaurant and the famous Steve Jobs had come in, so the owner of the restaurant came out to shank, shake his hand, not knowing that that was his son. And Steve didn't know at that time that that was his father. But the interesting thing is that both father and son refused ever to contact each other when they knew who they were. And if I could have coached Steve Jobs, I would have said, that's not a good thing, because you're giving a, an unfortunate message to your own children. And I think we're likely to repeat the same patterns. You know how troubled you were by your parents giving you up and you never knew about them. Why would you want to do that to your children? And why not find out about your father? Even no matter who he is, you're learning your own history. So I think that's the kind of input I would want to give somebody. Is don't, don't perpetuate problematic relationships down the generations. It's not a good idea. And I know this is highly speculative, but why do you think some people would do that, would ignore the repeating patterns? Is it an unconscious block? Uh, is it they feel that if it happened to them, it must be okay? What's your take on that? I, I think somehow that, that people get stuck and the pain is just plays larger than the impulse to do what is even the right thing, you know? And so, and so they unfortunately repeat those patterns. I think it's it's very sad. It is sad. It's really an amazing story. The Steve Jobs is amazing. I mean, it's right in front of his very face, and he's doing the same thing. I guess it kind of corroborates that old adage, right? The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. But if I had access to his children, I would say to them, because I think that I'd, I'm pretty sure that the grandfather is still alive. They should go find him. And not only that, but think about it. Syria, oh, the father came from a large family. I have no idea what happened to them. But now, whenever I hear about Syria, I'm always thinking, I wonder what has happened to that family by now. You know? That's a good point. That's a really good point. Was an immigrant, but, but did any of his brothers or sisters come here and do they have children? You know, you often look like your cousins. I mean, there are all these connections. And also, the, the, the ones who stayed in Syria probably knew more about the family history and might be able to tell them things that would be of interest. That's a great point. Dr. McGoldrick, we're all out of time. What a fascinating conversation. Dr. McGoldrick, where do we find more information about you? Well, you could go to our website, multiculturalfamily.org. I have a new book, The Genogram Case Book, which is coming out in May, I hope, oh, which May. is a companion to my Genogram book, and also The Genogram Journey, which looks at a lot of famous families. The Steve Jobs story is on our website, and hopefully Trump and Hillary will, as soon as <laughs> I get around to putting them together, I'll try to put a story up on them. Thank you again, Dr. McGoldick, very, much, very much. Great to talk to you. There you go, everyone. Dr. Monica McGoldrick, you can find her at multiculturalfamily.org. I'm telling you, a great place, really fascinating stuff, and she has some fabulous books. If you're a therapist right now or a student in psychology, you must read books.